Welcome everyone to the Yukon Humanities Institute um, in its virtual extension. I'm Yohei Igarashi, Associate Director here at the Institute, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Today's talk is part of our Digital Humanities and Media Studies Initiative, and we have what I expect to be a fascinating presentation for you by Diana C. Greenwald on her recent and superb book, Painting by Numbers, data-driven histories of 19th century art. Um, I'll add briefly that my colleague at the Institute, Alexis Boylan, a scholar of visual culture, mentioned the book to me, I think last summer. She had read it and said it was great. I picked it up and I found it to be one of my favorite reads, at least of the academic variety recently, at least this academic year. And so I recommend painting by numbers to all of you in the audience as well. So let me introduce our speaker, Diana Greenwald. She is an art historian and economic historian. Her work uses both statistical and qualitative analyses to explore the relationship between art and broader social and economic change during the 19th and early 20th centuries, particularly in the US and in France. Her first book, which I just mentioned, Painting by Numbers, was published by Princeton in 2021. And I believe she'll be talking about some of her methods and findings from one of the case studies from that book. Diana is currently the William and Leah Purvu Interim Curator of the Collection at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. Prior to joining the Gardner, she was an Andrew w. w. Mellon Postdoctoral Curatorial Fellow at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., working in the Departments of American and British Paintings and Modern Prints and Drawings. Diana received her doctorate in history from the University of Oxford, where she also got her MPhil in economic and social history. And before that, she received a bachelor's degree in art history from Columbia. So thank you all for joining and thanks so much to Diana for joining us. I'll turn things over to you now. Great, thank you so much for having me. Sorry, because of inclement weather, I'm coming to you live from my kitchen in Boston, very exciting. But I'm thrilled to be with you today and to have the chance to, to talk about the book and some data-driven art history. I'll be talking about my book, which Yohei just very, very generously introduced. It came out at this point, it's hard to believe, almost two years ago. And so I'm actually going to start off with a bit of an anecdote, which is how I start the book as well. And it starts with an IBM punch card. And you're probably thinking the, there's kind of ironic to be talking about IBM punch cards in this day and age of, of Zoom. But what I love about this and the story that it alludes to is there's actually a, a quite famous art historian who is not far from you guys, who was at Yale for many years, named Jules Prown. And he's really well known in art history for the study of 18th and 19th century American art. And he's particularly well known for, for close looking. And despite this reputation of being incredibly object focused, as it turns out, in the mid-1960s, he actually got really intrigued by IBM punch cards and by statistics. He was working on what we call an art history, and you'll forgive me, I'm not sure how much of the audience are art historians or not, what he call, what we call a catalog raisonné, so a kind of full list of works of art by a particular artist. In this case, John Singleton Copley, we're seeing one of Copley's images of a notable colonial American. And while he was doing this work and compiling all these lists of information about Copley's work and Copley's sitters, he suddenly realized that he could maybe use the new fancy IBM mainframe at Yale to see if there were any relationships between what Copley was painting and the socio and economic profiles of his sitters. So did ministers commission a certain type of painting did it matter where people lived? All sorts of things about their class. And he actually found some results, which was pretty cool. He presented them at the major annual conference for art historians called CAA. And he was actually booed. He says sort of jokingly, and there was some, a lot of nervous laughter, but basically it was completely panned. The community of art historians hated it. And 
as a result of this experience, he said something, and again, this was in the 1960s, that was actually really prescient, I think, about the relationship between humanities and computers. And that was that on the basis of this experience, he was convinced that art historians would open their arms and their minds to using computers to find things. So as what he called it, automated information retrieval, you can think of the Google search, a library catalog search, but that they would resist the more complex possibilities that computers and statistics presented, that they would just, those, those tools, that element of digital tools for analysis would, would not be embraced. And he turned out to be right. I like to think that's finally starting to change about 50 years later, but good old Jules Brown kind of set the tone. And I think that's where I've tried to come in and think about how can we embrace computers or more specifically statistics to address questions in art history, not just to use computers to find information. So with that kind of little prelude, um, I'm just going to give you a little guide of where we're going to go today. I'll talk a little bit about economic history, which is my other discipline, and how I think it's a useful guide for data-driven histories of art. Then we'll talk about what data is even out there in the art world, and I'm sure there are corollaries in other fields. Um, Some of the things that we can learn from what I think of as this macroscopic zoomed out view, that'll be a pretty common phrase, I think, for people who, who engage with the English literature. That, that deals with digital humanities, and then this case study, which is based on one of the chapters from my book, which has kind of a tongue-in-cheek title of why have there been no great women artists, and we'll talk about stats and, and labor economics. So first, what the heck is economic history, and why can it be a guide for us doing data-driven art history? And so the first thing that I often like to point out is that economic history is not necessarily what everyone thinks it is. It's not just the study of money or the study of capitalism in the past or trade. I mean, it is that, but it's more than that. It can also be about using data to look at historical relationships and trends that would be invisible with a purely qualitative approach. And so I often put up this slide. It's from a really interesting study done by a combo of actually political scientists and economists. But what we're looking at here is on the left-hand axis, and I don't know if you can see my cursor, the vote share for Barack Obama in 2008 at both the state and county level. And at the on the x-axis, we're looking at the proportion of the population in those states and counties that was enslaved at the outbreak of the Civil War. And so what you're actually seeing is that the greater the number of enslaved people in a state or county, the less likely that state or county was to vote for Barack Obama in overwhelming numbers. And what these scholars are arguing is that there's a relationship between kind of long, deep structural racism in the form of kind of large amounts of enslavement and contemporary, you know, over 100 years later, about 150 years later, political behavior and voting. I use this example just to point out that economic and history in this case can be about things that you might not think of as, quote, economic, right? It really is also economic methods applied to historical and cultural, uh, historical and cultural questioning and, and problematics that we want to address. The other thing that I think is a really important point that economic historians think a lot about is something called selection bias or sample bias, sampling bias. And so the reason I like to try to bring this up is, and you're like, what the heck is this graph? Why is this about heights? I think it's best described with examples. So what we're looking at here is actually historic heights of men between 1896 and 1996 in a range of different countries. This metric, so heights, has often been used in economic history to gauge the health of populations. More or less, the assumption is that the taller you are, the healthier you are. That's kind of the the rough proxy. Now, what was really fascinating is there's kind of an instance in economic history where people were studying and using this proxy of height to try and study health, and they realized something. 
the records that they were using are often military records. So these are when people are measured, when they join the military. And they realized with some good qualitative work that actually there were height minimums to get into certain militaries. And so what does that mean? It means that all the short people are kicked out. So your sample suddenly is only tall people. It's a truncated sample. And if you were to draw a conclusion from that sample, not knowing about this height minimum, you would think that people were much healthier than they were. The selection bias could severely kind of compromise your conclusions about a historical fact. And don't worry, I promise this is the end of the discussion of heights in this talk about the humanities, but I like this example because I often think as an, as an art historian, when we're studying the canon, what is our height minimum? What is that kind of like boundary that's cutting out certain artists, certain works of art from making it into the canon, from being preserved, from being studied? And the answer is that there is no simple height minimum. It's not so clear. It's a little bit more fluid. It's filtered through decades and decades of tastes of institutional issues and things, some of which we'll talk about later in this talk. But we never really kind of ask, ask ourselves as our historians about selection bias in a really rigorous way. And I think the potential for a data-driven art history is to provide more information about the sample of artwork about the population really of artwork that was created in the past and to help us better understand the sample that we've traditionally focused on and if possible to kind of expand that sample. Okay, so to expand the sample, you actually have to have some data, right? And so where is it is often a question that I get. And my first answer is usually it's in lists. <laughs> So if you're an art historian and you've ever kind of seen a bunch of things with lists, then that's probably a data set just in waiting. And art historians are great. They always love to make lists of things. So what we're actually looking at here is a page from a publication from the 1940s, which there were actually kind of two volumes where Mary Bartlett Cowdery went through all the catalogs for the annual exhibitions at a school and exhibition venue in New York called the National Academy of Design. And she transcribed them and organized them into a list by artist. So we have the artist's name, birth and death dates, the year of exhibition is here, their address, and titles, as well as the number in the catalog. And, and in some instances, whether or not it, a work of art was for sale. So from this, you can get to, with transcription, and I can talk about the challenges of that and the cost of it. Some things can be OCR now, it's getting much better you can get to a workable spreadsheet, uh, which I think is incredibly valuable. Really, it's Mary Bartlett Cowdery who did the, most of the work. And then from that, you can get to data, which you'll see we're gonna put to use later in our case study. The other places to find art historical data are online, which is maybe not a surprise. Museum websites are a great source. I think people often think of museum websites in kind of Crown's formulation as just a place to get information, but actually they're massively valuable data sources as well, because everything that's behind something like this, this is an object page from the National Gallery of Arts website. It's actually supported by something called a collection management system, which all museums use, and this can export to a spreadsheet. So all the hundreds of thousands of objects in many, many major museums, with more or less the click of a button, you can export that data to a spreadsheet and start working with it. And we'll see that again later on. Last but not least, I'm going to give a little bit of a shout out to some data that I'm going to use to introduce what we can learn from the macroscopic view. This is a, a colleague and mentor of mine from Oxford. His name is John Whiteley. He unfortunately passed away a few years ago. He was a curator at the Ashmolean, and he is also, which is the museum at, the, at Oxford, he was one of these scholars who, again, loved making lists and indices, and he really got me started. So another place to look, this was in the rare books, like manuscript stacks at Oxford. He made this incredibly index to all the paintings shown at a major exhibition venue called the Paris Salon, which was the kind of principal exhibition venue in 19th century France. 
this looks kind of nuts, <laughs> this, uh, this TypeScript. It does make sense. And it turned out it was very machine readable. But basically the way this works is that he has a category that's a keyword, in this case, sowing, meaning spreading of seeds. You have a colon and then you have 1850-2221. This means that painting 2,221 shown at the Paris Salon in 1850 and 2,221 is its number in the, in the annual kind of catalog was a depiction of this activity of sowing seeds. So we can actually go to the source Turns out it was a quite famous painting by an artist named Jean-Francois Millet called The Sower. And so John, who put together an index that is just so detailed, it was like insane. I love showing this example. He not only kind of provided keywords this is based on titles all the way down to like, is it a dog or a cat? But he went to the breed level, which I think might just prove that um, he's English. But anyway. You can see the cute dog. So very, very, very specific. Thank you to mid 20th century scholars for all of this. And we'll kind of start with something based on John's work and on that Whiteley index to think about what we can learn from this kind of zoomed out view. It's a pretty fun example, at least it's one that I enjoy as a bit of a nerd about 19th century France. But at the most basic level, we can take those data sets and turn them into pretty straightforward line graphs and learn some things right away. So what we've got here is I've plotted the percentage of portraits shown at the Paris Salon that depict members of the House of Bourbon, so the, the royals, the kings, right, all the Louis. And then we've got members of the Bonaparte family, so Napoleon, et cetera. And the first thing you'll notice, we've got time of year of exhibition on the x-axis, we've got percentage on the y, is we're moving up, we're moving up. 1790, we have kind of a peak of portraits, or at least an initial peak, and then no, no surprise there, the kings of France and queens disappear. I think we all know it's the French Revolution, Louis XVI loses his head, there are no more portraits of them. The Bonapartes, really engage in portraiture in this particular venue of the Paris Salon, this major state-sponsored exhibition. And then this I found really, really interesting, which is that this huge spike in Bourbon depiction is the restoration, right? So it's Louis XVIII, it's an attempt by the Ancien Regime to make a comeback, and they really double down on a very, what feels like quite an old visual medium of portraiture, of formal oil portraiture in a major exhibition venue. Clearly that regime doesn't work out for those who, who know, who study France, there's a lot of regime change. And then we have kind of a resurgence of depictions of Bonaparte's of the second empire. And so on the one hand, this is not like a massive surprise that politics are interacting with a major state sponsored exhibition. But you can already just learn a couple of things from taking this view, one of which is that the restoration is really going hard, like I said, on this particular medium for trying to communicate power. And the Bonapartes, for all the famous portraits of Napoleon out there, a little bit less so, which I certainly found surprising. You know, there are other things that we can learn. This is these are just, this is from one of the chapters in the book that deals with like images of landscape and rural genre painting. So images of rural life, like that sower we saw before. For the art historians, if you're out there, what's sort of interesting about this is rural genre gets an enormous amount of attention in the literature about 19th century France. And it turns out when you zoom out, it's not nearly as prominent as you might expect in terms of depictions of rural life and the possible relationship to industrialization. With another data set, again, just a bit of a plug if you get interested and you want to kind of check it out in the book, you can look at which countries and which places are shown, in this case at the Royal Academy, kind of the major exhibition venue in England. You know, in this case, we're looking at 1769 to 1914. And something that was really interesting here, by the way, is I was looking for depictions of, of British colonies and found that they were almost not present on the walls of the Royal Academy. There's real home bias in terms of artists depicting certain places and even India for all of its political and financial importance to the, to the British Empire is very rarely shown, which raises all sorts of interesting questions or rarely shown in this venue and in oils, I should say. Okay, 
But now we'll we'll move on to kind of a more extensive a more extensive case study and really trying to dig into how we can combine this kind of zoomed out graphic statistical view with some more qualitative questions and, and analysis. So some of you may have read Linda Nochlin's famous essay, Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists? And I'm going to kind of propose one of my own, not at all competing with Nochlin. If anything, I think it's a bit of a, it's a compliment as to trying to explain kind of this perception or this, this feeling that there are no great women artists, right? So I'll, I'll zoom out a bit. So I'm a curator. So I work in a museum all the time and I spend a lot of time with objects, which is really great. And I've been very lucky in that sometimes working with something completely different than let's say a bunch of spreadsheets can end up sparking some creativity. And that's what happened here. So this fantastic poster by the feminist artist collective, the Gorilla Girls, I, I happened to be working on a little show of prints about it was about humor and art. And this poster was a, was a contender for the checklist. And so I was looking at this and you can see the question, do women have to be naked to get into the Met Museum? And they say less than 5% of the artists in the modern art sections are women, but 85% of the nudes are female. And so basically what these artists did, this collective did, is they went around and they counted in the Met to see how many women artists were on display. And of course that most of the nudes shown were women. And so I had this piece in mind and this 5% number, while I happened to be in the other part of my job as a postdoc, looking at a large collection of 19th century American still life painting that had just been gifted to the National Gallery of Art, actually by an art historian who since passed away named Bill Gertz. And as I was cataloging, and I should say cataloging for those who, who aren't as familiar with museums is when something enters a collection, we actually have to enter the basic information about those works of art into the collection management system. Actually that back end of museum websites that I showed you earlier in the presentation. So you measure things, you research the artists, you enter life and death dates. You, I mean, there's a whole bunch of, of things that you do. And as I was doing this, I sort of had this sense that there seemed to be more women active, or there seemed to be a lot of women artists in this collection of American still life paintings. Seemed to be more than were in our kind of general 19th century American art holdings, and certainly more than the kind of 5% number that was stuck in my brain from also working on the Gorilla Girls. And I was like, huh, I wonder if this is like a quirk of the Gertz collection or if this is something else of interest. And so I realized that I actually had the data to try and tease that out. I showed you the kind of list very early on of artists that showed at the National Academy of Design. Here is a picture of the building just as a refresher. So this is a major art school and art exhibition venue in New York in the 19th century. And so using the data derived from that, that publication that lists all the different exhibitors over time, I was able to do a couple of things. And the first one was really just the very basic percentage of paintings exhibited that were by women artists. And the way that I was able to do this is um, there's actually APIs online, it's called the gender API. You can run your data through that and it uses a couple of different things to give a probability of whether or not that artist is, you know, is presenting as a woman or a man based on the name they're using and the honorific. And we can actually talk about that. That has a couple of issues, but let's just say kind of blunt instrument. What you're going to see is that there are actually a fair number of women artists who are participating in this major exhibition venue, certainly after the Civil War, right? You know, if you were to take an average over the whole amount, it's about 13%, but it's, it's higher post-1860. And so, you know, that seemed reasonably high to me, actually, considering just my instincts about museum collections. You know, we could do the same thing for genre. So in this case, we have still life paintings, and you can see, I just that they're reasonably rare actually at the National Academy of Design. Again, for the non-art historians in the room, still life tends to be considered the quote lowest genre. So the, le the least prestigious. And so 
the kind of not super common presence. I mean, it's present, but the fact that it might not be as common as say genre painting or landscape painting in this venue is not hugely surprising. But then what I really wanted to do was combine these two trends. And so what we're looking at here is of the artists exhibiting still lifes, right? How many of the artists exhibiting still lifes are men or are women, right? Or let me put it differently. So what we're looking at is that male artists, right? On average, you know, about 10% of works by male artists that are being shown are still life paintings. Women, and here it's a little bit messy, right? Because you've got what we call a small denominator problem. Things are just like jagged because there are very few women participating. So anytime one of the two women does a still life painting, it's like 50% still life. But when we get past 1860 and things get a little bit more regular, you see that women on average of their output, you've got about 30, 25, 30% over the whole sample of what they're producing is still life painting. So what it means is women are much, much more active in still life painting than men are. Now, this might not be a massive surprise. You're sort of thinking like, oh, you know, women paint flowers. It's appropriate to this kind of Victorian concept of, of, of womanhood. And I'd say that for a long time, that's kind of been the default position, right? It was, it was appropriate for, for women to paint still life. And that must be, that must be why they do it. And I actually want to kind of unpack that a little bit, but the other thing I want to highlight before we start kind of unpacking that myth of like why women do still life painting is that what we've just seen is that a genre in which women are much more active in the 19th century is also a genre that I'll highlight tends to be pretty neglected in museum collections. The National Academy of Design was kind of a pipeline to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And here we're having a view of the American wing. So the principal kind of holding of 19th century American art at the Met, like the kind of big canonical institution in the US. And what I like about this view is you'll see that there's not a heck of a lot of still life at least on this initial axis, right? See a lot of kind of heroic, you've got Washington crossing the Delaware, we have some genre painting. And this is borne out also in the numbers. And so using that collection management system, which is called TMS, I could actually kind of compare some of the historical trends to the, the population of works of art in the Metropolitan Museum, kind of the sample that often gets studied, let's say, by a lot of historians of American art. And so the first thing that you can see, if we look at all fine arts, and there are about 6,000 works in this department, you know, just over 6% of them are by women. Now, so the, gen and we also have some anonymous things, right? Gender of maker unknown, and people could say, well, anonymous is probably women. And, you know, we can, we can definitely talk about that. But the ones that we can identify, 6% are by women. When you move to still life painting, suddenly it's 23% or almost 24% of the works are by women artists, right? So we see, you know, mirroring the historical trends, women are more active in still life painting. But what I want you to focus on is the N, right? There are only 105 still life paintings in the Metropolitan Museum's American Wing collection at the time that this data was taken, which at this point is about four or five years ago. So what we're seeing again is that women are much more active in a genre that is under collected, you know, pretty severely under collected compared to the his history by a major institution. Okay, so we see this kind of discrepancy between the historical numbers and, and the museum numbers both in terms of demographics and in genre. And now I kind of want to dig into why women are so active in still life painting, like why this particular subset of genre beyond the kind of social convention that it's appropriate to, to paint flowers. Often art historians will talk about the fact that women didn't have as much access to formal, uh, to formal training. This is sort of true. It's more true in Europe, it turns out. American 
American art schools were poorer than their state-sponsored European counterparts. They actually started taking women pupils much earlier than their European counterparts. And as you can see here in this 1879 image, some programs actually allowed women to participate in, uh, in life drawing class. You know, and this is at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, another major art school, also one of the more radical ones. But when we delve into the details, you know, women actually have a decent amount of access to artistic education at the time that doesn't involve just, just fruit and flower painting. So I wanted to kind of like dig in a little bit more. And it happened to be that there's a whole kind of literature about women's labor that exists in the economic history literature. And in particular, there's a scholar named Claudia Golden. She's just, just across the river at Harvard. And she has done some really interesting work on the concept of time constraint and women's labor. And so if you'll bear with me for, for a quick second, she studied kind of, she studied the gender wage gap and she was really interested in why women, you know, who graduate at this point from college in equal or greater numbers who are really engaged in higher education, why are they not kind of thriving in particular groups of occupations? Like, and let's take a, a corporate lawyer as an example and why they're kind of relatively few corporate law partners who are women. And she found that one of the kind of clear markers that hampered women's success in a given field had to do with time demands. And so meaning if hours are really, really long, but more importantly than just long hours, if hours are unpredictable. So if you're client facing or if you're based on deals or things are just not predictable, women do really poorly in terms of kind of progression and attainment in those settings. And then if, if you work in teams, so again, if your time is not your own and it's not predictable, it tends to be a field in which women are less successful. And again, a corporate lawyer is kind of a classic example of this. The client says to do it, you have to do it. You're just completely at the behest of, of who you're working for of, and you have no control over your time. This is a problem in part because women, as we know, as much progress as we've made, often shoulder most of or a disproportionate amount of domestic burden at home, particularly once they have children. If they have children, you know that, that a lot of the gender wage gap actually comes from the difference between mothers and men, not just sort of women, certainly not between childless women and men. And so there's an incompatibility between kind of domestic demands and professional demands, particularly when those professional time demands are really unpredictable. Claudia Goldham calls them both greedy. You have greedy home demands and greedy work demands. However, there are examples and kind of shining examples of women really thriving in particular fields. And Goldham provides this fabulous example of pharmacy. So it used to be that pharmacists were majority men. This was in part because to be a pharmacist, you were also a small business owner and you were kind of always on the hook. If anything went wrong, the buck stopped with you as the owner of your pharmacy. It was a very kind of time unpredictable, client facing, time demanding job. And in the last kind of 20, 30 years, this has changed and becoming a pharmacist has become shift work. So you kind of work for CVS, you check in for your shift, you do the work. I mean, it's highly skilled, really important work. And then when you leave, you're done. So when you're done, you're done, you're off of work your schedule is completely predictable. And with this kind of change to industrial organization, women suddenly start completely dominating pharmacy to the point where Golden gives some sort of statistic, but it's something like 70% of pharmacists in the US are now women. And because it turns out it is shift work works really well with balancing domestic responsibilities too. And so if we think through this kind of labor problem across the entire economy and, and about women's labor, I started thinking about how this applies to different genres of, of painting. And you can imagine that a portraitist, so someone who's painting you know, pictures of rich people basically, is a little bit like the corporate lawyer of the art world. 
They are completely at the behest of their clients, their schedule, their timing. I can tell you, I work at a museum called the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. She made a quite famous painter named John Singer Sargent do like 40 sittings with her. It's not quite that many, but they were, he was painting her for a solid two and a half months on her schedule all the time. You could say the same, by the way, in landscape painting, it often involved, particularly in the United States, a trip out West with male dominated kind of survey parties, which presents its own issues, but it's like a huge amount of time, not really at your control, not really under your control and involves long absences. Still life painting, on the other hand, happens to be a little bit like the shift work of art, right? The fruit and flowers don't really have their own schedule that they are demanding of you. I mean, I guess they could rot, but you can actually set them up and come and go as you please based on your own schedule, sort of like shift work. And importantly, in domestic space, right? You don't need your own studio space. Still life tends to be smaller to complete, quicker to complete. All in all, it's a much less time demanding genre. And once you kind of think about the idea of time constraint and, and women artists, you start to see kind of other places where this starts to show up. And one will place is medium. So a medium is like painting versus drawing versus sculpture, et cetera. And so here we're looking at, at male artists in the American wing. So that same department at the Met and the division of the works by them by medium. And so you'll see the largest category is drawings and pastels. It's not hugely surprising. That's actually true of most museum collections. And then the second most common kind of object type category is oil painting and then watercolors and then sculpture, right? Now, if we look at this mix for women, we'll see a couple of things. Miniatures are first, which is basically watercolor on kind of their small little, small little paintings on often on ivory or other kind of backing. So we've got these little miniatures first, also quite quick to complete based on scale. Drawings and pastels, second, more works on paper, then watercolors, right? And then just 12.6% of the objects are paintings. And the reason this is important, if we compare this kind of 12.6% of paintings to the 21% for men, and we go back to, and again, there's sort of the non-art historians in the room, we go back to this view of the American wing and all this kind of like heroic landscape, it's also all oil painting. So it turns out the like quicker media of works on paper, which are quicker to complete, are also light sensitive and can't be displayed. Oil painting, sculpture, it can be up all the time. Works on paper, miniatures as well, not so much. So when we go back and we look at this mix of works by women artists in the American wing, you know, all 357 works, all of this is light sensitive and actually can't be seen the majority of the time. So what you're left with is almost kind of a weird double discrimination, right? Women are active in a genre that American museums tend not to collect and are not so present. And they're active in media that even if the museums collect them, they can't even put them up, you know, the majority of the time for conservation reasons. So this kind of sense of like, why are there no great women artists is actually being compounded by a couple of these structural things that we can tie back to being time constrained, to work in, in subjects that work better with a time constrained schedule and to work in media that are faster. I've got a little bit of time left. I'm gonna just briefly talk about, to finish up a couple of things. I love going kind of behind the data and what people do. And I think some of this like time poverty affecting women artists is best illustrated by a particular example. In this case about Lily Martin Spencer, she's this sort of exceptional woman artist who as probably the most famous American woman artist in the antebellum period. She grew up in an incredibly progressive feminist household in Ohio. She ends up marrying a man named Benjamin Spencer, who this is actually a picture of him, who if you can believe it in the 19th century becomes a stay at home parent and partner. She is the primary breadwinner as an artist. Nonetheless, they end up having seven children who survive into adulthood. And she's pregnant more often than that. And 
we have her letters from this experience from her life that she's writing home to her mom. And we can see a couple of things, both in the letters, and I'm going to show you a little bit of data, but she's constantly writing home about she, how she has no time to do anything, right? She wants to work, but she has the kids. They want to hire someone to help take care of the kids or to help take care of the house, but she can't find anyone. And then managing that person, she still has no time to work. I have no time. I have no time. I have no time to earn enough money to hire someone to then allow me to have more time to earn money. It's like a constant refrain in all of her letters sent home. And we can actually see as best we can approximate that her productivity, it holds up early on. This is pre-children, pre-marriage. This is through children one, two, and three. And she's still really quite productive. And then we get to three plus children here who she and Benjamin are taking care of. And things really sadly take a dive in terms of her productivity. And you can hear and you can read her letters becoming more panicked about having more children and having more demands on her time. And so you can see kind of in the archive and then even in the, in the numbers of this particular artist, what it means for a woman artist to be balancing some of these domestic demands and and a professional ambition, even with a stay-at-home supportive husband. So I'll just, two last final thoughts. Part of the reason I wanted to dig into this and to think about time constraint in women artists is that if we just assume that like women painted still life because it was appropriate, then we should assume that you know women artists of the 19th century were largely constrained by let's say social convention and then that doesn't really tell us much about our, our present, let's say, and about women artists' attainment today, which we know, despite the fact that they are outgraduating men from art schools, continues to lag. And I think what kind of this concept of time constraint being a factor from the 19th century to the present does for us is it helps us kind of draw a line as to what might still be structurally hampering women artists' achievements. And I think there are a couple of really fabulous works that highlight this. This is a work by Lenka Clayton. It's called An Artist Residency in Motherhood. And she talks about working in nap length chunks and what that means. But even sort of beyond these really explicit things, again, it happened to be that I was at work at, at this case at the NGA. And at the same time that I was working on these topics, we had a retrospective of this artist, Rachel White Reed. She's a major kind of British sculptor who won something called the Turner Prize in 1992 for this work. You see a study for it at left. It's called House. And she basically took a plaster cast of an entire house that was going to be demolished. It's like a huge, massive undertaking that was very impressive and large and splashy and won her a lot of acclaim. It really made her career. But in this retrospective, you also saw her later work at right. We have it here. It's called Lineup from 2007 to 2008. This is after she had kind of established herself and she had, she'd started a family. And it turns out these are just cast toilet rolls. They're the leftover toilet rolls that her household was producing. And she explicitly says that this was what she had the time to do and make in kind of her new structure of her life. And it's a gorgeous piece and really poignant, but it's actually kind of a still life and it's quite small. And I asked myself walking through this gallery, I mean, even as a curator, if Rachel Whiteread hadn't started her career with like the big heroic, I'm gonna go cast a gigantic house, would we have paid any attention to the smaller kind of domestically scaled, but no less beautiful and I think no less poignant lineup that she produced many years later. If she'd started with this, would she be the famous artist that she is today? And sadly, I think the answer is no. I think we're drawn to the big and the heroic and that's actually to the detriment of how inclusive our canon is and it's exacerbating some of the structural issues that women artists are facing. Okay. Thank you so much. I will leave it there. Thank you so much, Diana. That was that was brilliant. So as we wait for some questions to come in, I thought I might begin with a question of my own. So, you, so much of your discussion reminded me of parallel discussions in literary study. And I don't know as much about the state of art history other than from 
when you zoom out in your introduction and in, in the conclusion of your book. In literary study, there's often this really simplistic account of the scholars versus the critics, where the scholars are interested in facts and the critics are more the literary connoisseurs and are associated with close reading. And it sounds like there's something maybe perhaps also simplistic in art history where you have close looking versus this kind of data-driven or empirical quantitative work. And it seems like there have historically been figures who reconcile these, who do a kind of mixed methods, quantitative and qualitative, Jules Crown doing close looking and his computational work. And of, co of course, you yourself. And same with in English. And yet I think that that split remains. The computational people go do their stuff, but there's still a very strong clinging and, and I think rightfully so in an, in an investment in close reading and the object itself and something analogous to close looking. So I, I wanted to know, where do you think art history is headed in this, in light of all of this in the next, say, 15 or 20 years? Yeah, it's it's a great question. And I think, um, you know, a lot of the, you know, English, English literature, literary studies was ahead of art history, I think. And despite, so Jules Proun, I mean, Jules Proun just doing this in the 60s is awesome and like an outlier. And then he got booed at a conference and he actually abandoned it, right? He was like, okay, I'm just going to do my material culture thing and look at a desk for 25 minutes or an hour and tell you what I learned about it. So I think art history has been kind of math phobic, I would call it forever. <laughs> and I think the kind of issue that in that divide that you're talking about that I've run into is a sense that like, if you present graphs, you're trying to claim that something is objective, right? That if you are using data, it's that this is the objective truth that I am showing you. And, it, and that's not at all what it is, nor what I'm saying. I think that all it is, is a different perspective on problems that our historians typically have tackled pretty much exclusively with, I would say, archival research, biographical research, you know, and, and really close engagement with the objects. That's really what we do. And plus, of course, some theoretical engagement as well. But we've really always gone, gone kind of artist by artist and object by object. And cognitively, you can't do that for like 30,000 objects, you know, 98% of which have disappeared from the historical record. So what this is, is kind of asking art historians to think about this, this, this other way to add to the viewpoint that they've had for a long time. So it's, I don't know that we even had like, you know, there's definitely empirical stuff, there's social history of art, I don't want to be dismissive, I mean, it's like a major tradition. But yeah, I don't know that we had really who people who have described themselves as computational before, I think it's really just starting in our field. That being said, I think with a more kind of digitally literate cohort of grad students coming through who are, you know, this, these are not complicated statistics I've shown today at all. Like it's basically, you can do it with Excel and counting things. And so it's actually quite low hanging fruit to have a, a useful complementary view. And so it's starting bit by bit to come through like it is an option and a compliment and not necessarily a threat. But I definitely have had some very negative reactions. I like my first peer review, someone told me statistics were boring and then they rejected the paper. So that was fun. <laughs> um, well, I had a follow-up question. I mean, so many of the of your findings deal with, I, I think I would call metadata, like mm -hmm. gender of the artist, manual tags, like the whitely manually coded subject matter, even the kinds of dogs represented. Do you think in future computational studies, there are ways to analyze the, the content of the painting too, going not just with like the metadata that, that oftentimes needs to be done by hand, but rather, I don't know, the analysis of color or, I mean, there must be ways not maybe automate fully or partially automated where you can start to work with what's within the frame too. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I think there is some increasingly, like if you think of like a Google image reverse search, like these, these abilities to kind of look at images in an automated or computational way are emerging. What I will say though, is 
that what that does do is that means the art or the argument has to be photographed at all. And I think what I've learned from digging into this, at least if you want to do the 19th century, I mean, and honestly, I think it'll probably be true moving forward. It's just about a kind of test of time thing. Most of the art doesn't exist anymore in any accessible way. So your choice is kind of like, you could, you know, do really interesting computational things, I think, moving forward with, with visual things, but you're going to be constrained to museum data sets. And that being said, museums that have high res images that are open source. So now you're in like the top most, you know, kind of most exclusive museums. So it's, it's a bit of a trade off. I think there's room for both. But I do think sometimes, and it's sort of sad for art historians, but all that's left is the metadata, you know, because the the paintings have been destroyed or in or in accessible private collections. Right, that makes sense. So we have a question from my colleague Alexis Boylan, whom I mentioned. She says, this was amazing. Thanks so much. Where are you taking data next? And what starts the process for you? The database or a problem? Oh, that's a really good question. And a lot of people disagree with me on this. So I, I tend to start with the problem. It's a little bit, okay, actually, oh, so I'll say what's next. And then I'll say it's a so the first thing is once you once I wrote this book, I became like the village well for art historians and data. They were like, I think I have a data set. <laughs> they would like come to me and they'd be like, is this a data set? And so I worked on a paper that was published a couple, a few months ago now, which a colleague of mine, Nika Elder, who's a professor at American University, had this list of information about the relationship between Copley's sitters. So those same sitters that Jules Brown was working on and their relationships to slavery. And we did a whole study of kind of what percentage of his sitters enslaved people, what was their relationship to it. And, you know, this has effects for how we think about these paintings, which are now on the walls of many museums, particularly in New England. I see he was a Boston artist. So that was kind of the data set came to me. And it's like, how, how do we make clear the impact of the fact it turned out 63% of the sitters enslaved people or, you know, their families enslaved people. How do we make that impact clear in a quantitative way? Like it started with the data and what are other connections we can see? Like maritime communities, there are much higher rates of, of enslavement among, among the Copley sitters. So that started with the data set. In general, I, however, I would say I often advise people to think about what is their research question and does it actually need data to be answered is the first one. Because if you're really focused on, let's say, Degas pastels. There are only a few hundred of those. You don't really need necessarily to quantify to, to do a really close study of just this like one narrow thing if that's what your research question is really focused on. If your research question has to do with how did this artist's work change or this group of artists' works change in response to a big social and economic trend like industrialization or how representative is the Smithsonian American Art Museum of the production of American art, you know, between, I don't know, 1900 and 1950, then you're getting into a realm where you're talking about numbers, you're talking about trends that traditional art historical methods aren't always like capable of addressing. And so the first question is, do you need it? And then the second question is, is the data out there to address it? And the answer is sometimes no. You know, for economists, the most expensive time-consuming part of most of their work is data acquisition, whether that's running experiments or why they all use the same download data sets all the time because they're out there and they're easy to get. So sometimes with your research question, the data is either not there or it's it's too expensive basically in time and sometimes in real money to, to access. So anyway, there are two approaches, but I tend to go question first. And, and yet at the same time, it seems like they are they feed into one another, like if you have the question, but then you need the data. And I, I did want to ask you, what was the process like? So it seems like you had non-machine readable initially lists, indices. It sounded like maybe it was pre-OCR or partially OCR, but like, how did you, what was the process like? How long did it take? How did you, what kept you going through all of that? Yeah, that's a really good question. I try to be really explicit about it in the book and in the appendices. So the White Land X, actually, you could use OCR because he used punctuation in such a stable way that that was really easy. Thank God. 
And that was like 148,000 works kind of like that. The American ones that were hard copy books, those could not be machine read in a reasonable way. So I got grants and a lot of economists do this. And then you work with professional transcription services and you know, like full disclosure, it is like a firm that hires people. I think, and I know in this case, it was a firm that's based in the Philippines and they do this full time. And I had the funding to do that. And that's a whole other kind of can of worms about like, I did about 20% of the transcription myself to save the money. And I was also a grad student and had the time and the will, and I wanted to get to know my data. But if I had done it myself the whole time, I probably still wouldn't be done with my dissertation. And so there is like a real economic cost. And I was lucky to be at well-funded institutions and have the pre-docs to get it done. So we have a question from Mickey McElyay, a recent fellow of the Institute and a historian at UConn. So she, she writes fantastic talk and a set of questions. Thank you. Can you talk about possibilities for locating useful or weird and compelling data sets outside the current institutional frameworks of museums, archives, and universities? a really great question. I mean, I think you wouldn't call this weird. I mean, wiki data is like an increasingly like popular option. And if you're interested in art history, there's also the Getty Research Institute has like a massive amount of data they've made available. I guess that is the, that is the current institutional framework of museum archives and universities. God, I'm trying to think of like weird stuff. I mean, it's not, I think it's in the standard framework, but a lot of my stuff was just like dusty in the sense that, like I said, a lot of 20th century scholars made these incredible lists of things that were created as finding aids. So I'd say I'd really kind of think about it that way. If you think of something as being used in its institutional setting as a finding aid, it's probably a data set too. So that's true of museum collection searches or any kind of art collection search. And I think it really gets to that crown question of like people think of it as using it to retrieve information, but it also has other value. That's kind of where I found the sweet spot to be. Like, it, are people using it as a finding aid? Then it's probably actually a data set too. Sorry, I'm trying to think if there's other stuff I can think of at the moment. Photo archives, that's another good one. There are these kind of like the Frick has this amazing photo archives. There's something called Pharos, which is this like consortium of photo archives, which are these photographs of lots of works of art around the world that were in private collections, many of which don't exist. And that's, that's like a fabulous candidate, I think, for your kind of computer vision question, Yohei. So. Thanks. I wanted to sort of return to Alexis's question. Do you, do you, do you have a next project using similar methods from other disciplines like economic history or another project in general that doesn't use these methods? a good question. So now that I'm like a, a, a grown-up curator and not a postdoc anymore, I only have to go to many more meetings and do many more shows. So that does take up a lot of my time, but there are a couple of things I'm working on. So one actually kind of gets to the weird data set question. I'm collaborating with a conservator, an art conservator who has lots of information about like the materials and measurements of lots of paintings in 18th century Britain. And we're trying to link that to trends in industrialization and actually specialization and the creation of artist suppliers as a specific occupation and how that creates really standardized materials and canvases and really actually affects the material of art. And then I'm working on something that salon, the Paris salon that I mentioned, a grad student came to me who has an incredible data set about who actually won medals at the salon, so who is officially recognized. And we're doing what are called regressions. So it's a, it's, it's a economics like causal testing to see what determines who got a medal. And interestingly, even once you control for genre, so like issues of like women in still life, women still get fewer medals. So you, you see like this incredible sexism and actually quite a bit of nepotism driving the awards, which is really interesting. And so that's, that's going to be in an economics journal, but I hope it'll kind of cross over. More generally, I'm really interested in this concept in economics, which is called asymmetries of information. So that's when in a transaction, one party has more information about what they're buying or selling than the other party does. The classic example is the used car salesman who knows he's selling you a lemon. And the thing about art and art sales and kind of art canonization is it's in a constant sense of asymmetry of information because there is no kind of like one pure decide, like there's no one clear value. It's not a typical commodity. 
And I think the art world has set up a lot of institutions, including the behavior of museums, that are kind of created in response to this constant void of information about what is quote unquote good. And so that's kind of where I'm going with, with my next book project. Don't tell the director of my museum that I'm planning a next book project <laughs> that's not in the exhibition catalog for her. But that's, that's kind of where my head is at now. Like, how does that economic theory about information affect the art world? Well, we'll all look forward to those works as they as they come out. So I wanted to thank you again for your time, the brilliant book, which I hope people will check out and read. And yeah, thank you so much, despite all the weather contingencies for making time for us. Thank you so much for having me, Yohai. It was a real pleasure. And thanks for the great questions.